Welcome to the Empowered to Connect podcast, where we come together to discuss a healing-centered approach to engagement and well-being for ourselves, our families, and our communities. I'm J.D. Wilson, and I am the host of this podcast. And uh, let me encourage you, if you missed last week's episode, to go back and check out the announcement that we had at the end of the episode. Um, It is about the Dads Connected coaching program that we are launching at EmpoweredToConnect.org. It is an incredible program led by some men that I deeply respect and love. So if you uh, are in need of that, if you're a dad and you are thinking, man, I I could use somebody coming alongside and kind of coaching into my life or speaking into my life, or if you've got a group of dads that you meet with regularly and y'all could use some guidance, um, man, make sure that you check out EmpoweredToConnect.org. You can also forward that information onto the dads that you know uh, in your life as well. And if you missed last week's episode, uh, don't just fast forward to the end. Go back and listen to that whole thing, man, because Dan uh, was an incredible guest, Dan Coley, and we um, we loved having him on. Incredible wisdom from him. And uh, and he was he was so fun to get to talk to. So you will love getting to go back and hear that if you haven't already checked it out. Uh, today in the show we also have a, an incredible guest, and his name is Troy McPeak. Troy uh, was a uh, was a worker in the Texas juvenile justice system and was an ex football player. He definitely fit the bill of a a typical person working in a juvenile justice facility. Tough guy with a commanding presence who um, had a great connection with kids. And going through practitioner training at uh, TCU with the TBRI program uh, years ago completely changed his life. And he talks about uh, the, the changes that that made uh, in his own life with his own parenting, but but uh, specifically today talks through what it looked like to be in the juvenile justice system and using TBRI principles and what he found. And uh, I'll play a little bit of a spoiler out. Uh, spo- <laughs> I'll play a little bit of a spoiler here and just say what he found was that uh, the TBRI principles and uh, working to build strong, connected uh, relationships with the, 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 the people that he had, the, the kids he had in his care, uh, was wildly effective. Uh, and if you've been around TBRI, you've been around uh, Empowered to Connect for any amount of time, and you have yourself been implementing these principles um, with the kids that you have care for, uh, you, you will know that's no surprise. And so uh, one reason we wanted to have Troy on today is because uh, a typical criticism of this type of engagement, healing-centered engagement with uh, kids who are in tougher backgrounds specifically is that it doesn't work. And so uh, this is basically one big episode for us to say, yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, it does. And so Troy is uh, Troy is just one guy, but uh, Troy represents a growing number of people in juvenile justice systems and in uh, the school settings across the country that are starting to adopt TBRI principles and um, and kind of connected. Uh, attachment-rich principles into their caregiving strategies, and um, shocker, it's going really well. So uh, we wanted to have him on today. For those of you who work in this setting, you do not want to miss this. Forward this episode on to everybody that you know that works in a setting like Troy's. Um, And also just know, Troy grew up in South Central LA. Troy has a background um, where he was uh, around gangs constantly growing up. So when he encounters a lot of gang activity and, um, and kids connected to gangs, in the facilities he works with, he's going to use a lot of the different names of the different uh, gangs or different sects that they are in. Um, and so just know that ahead of time as you go into this episode, um, it's so, it's so, it's so good. You're going to love it. Welcome our guest now, Troy McPeak. <laughs> our guest today is Troy McPeak. And Troy is the Associate Director of the Texas Model with the Juvenile uh, with the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. Uh, and so, Troy, man, thank you so much for being here. Um, yes, sir. Appreciate you being on. Uh, what, why don't we start there? Will you kind of set the table for us with what, what your current role is uh, and, and what you do? Roger. So my current role as the associate director of the Texas model, right, which the Texas model is our trauma-informed correctional model. So really what we're doing is unprecedented. We're trying to overhaul, right, the old punitive mind state of what juvenile corrections is supposed to be and adopt and, and you know, deploy TBRI basically is what Texas model is really deeply rooted in, right? Along with elements of dialectical behavior therapy by Mr. Henry Schmidt and uh, some elements of motivational interviewing, but it's 
really deeply rooted in TBRI, uh, building healthy relationships with youth to help literally rewire their brain, right? And um, give them more pro-social skills, right? And uh, learn how to deal with their emotions and traumas that they've, you know, been through, learn how to regulate so that they can be pro productive in, in society once they leave our care. So my specific role, as I go around the state, right, uh, relentlessly, and I train as many people that will listen to me, you know, the elements of TBRI, how to connect with kids, how to intentionally connect with kids, how to foster those healthy relationships, how to set solid boundaries, um, you know, and then I get on the dorms, right, and I run nurture groups, right, and then... Um, you know, I'll touch on nurture groups a little bit later, but that's yeah. really our proactive strategy that we use to really pour pro-social skills into the kids, right? And yeah. really start to replace some of those maladaptive coping mechanisms that they've adopted over time, right? With, yeah. you know, means to help regulate themselves. But before you can do that, they have to first know how, you know, how they're feeling, Right. And, and not be shamed for being mad or angry, upset, yeah. or, ang you know, have anxiety, right? Oh, but so huge. what we're trying to do is replace those behaviors of punching walls or attacking people, right, with, you know, different coping strategies that they can use. Yeah. So through connection, like I said, we're really rewiring the brain. Man, so for those who don't really have a framework for, for how the juvenile justice system works, how... How different, how unique is what y'all are doing? Uh, kind of, will, will you talk about the industry standard for a moment? Like, what what is a normal environment when a kid's going into? Uh, what age group is this? Like, what what right. is a normal environment they're going into when they go to a, a facility like y'all's? Right, absolutely. So. We can get kids anywhere as young as 12, right, all the way wow. through, you know, 18 before they get aged out of the juvenile system okay. and go into the adult system, right? So even at the county level, now TJJD is kind of the prison for the state of Texas, right? And then you have the county level. So my previous job, right, last year, I was a supervisor in a residential treatment facility called CORE, right? But before it became CORE, when we implemented TBRI, we were the academy, and the academy was a military-based boot camp. So we had drill okay. instructors, you know, 20 years, you know, tankers, right? And, and they came to be punitive, you know what I mean? Came to provide sanctions for the kids. So if a kid would do something as not raise their hand in class, right, or just ask their neighbor something, you're outside in this hunting Texas, you know, 103 <laughs> Texas degree weather doing push-ups and, and sit-ups or whatever else for 15 minutes, yeah. all because you failed to, we call it T-WAP, right? Talking without permission. So mm. to answer your question, right, the traditional model of corrections has always been very punitive, right? So now what we're doing, we're implementing a trauma-informed model and educating staff on what is going on in the brain, right? And so what we do know is that most of our kids can be half of their chronological age, right? Depending on um, their ACE score, right? Which is adverse childhood um, experiences, experiences yeah. right? So, but all of these factors play a huge role in our development, both physical development, cognitive development. And then you, you know, you, you top that with, you know, mental health issues, right? So to have that punitive model when this kid has an outburst or whatever, we'd be restraining and wrestling with this kid all day long, right? So, I thank God that we implemented TBRI there because it allowed us another avenue, right, and really help and heal this young man, right? And we're not going to fix, you know, all the kids in, in a six-month to a year, right? Sure. So it, it, it takes time. And like I said, when, when we're talking about implementing this model right now across the state, I tell the staff all the time, it's a marathon, not a race, right? And just like you and I are having a conversation now, if we develop a friendship, it's going to happen organically over time. Right. And the same way with, with, you know, kids, with youth, right? And so me personally, I haven't met too many kids that, you know, I am unable to build a healthy relationship with for yeah. sure. Totally. And, you know, those those relationships last. Like I get, you know, 
Now, being in my role, I can't necessarily accept them, right? But I get Facebook friend requests and Instagram requests, right? Kids want to just DM me, hey, sir, I just want to let you know, man, how much I, you know, love the fact that you were there for me, right? Yeah. When I was yeah, yeah. not even there for myself throughout all these years. And, you know, I respectfully decline a Facebook, you know, request. <laughs> so I don't get myself in any kind of uh, scrutiny there. But, sure. you know, I will shoot them a message and tell them I'm going to continue to pray for them. You know yeah. what I mean? Because... Ultimately, we are the only ones sometimes who are pouring all of that love into these youth, right? So I'd love to know, I mean, I feel like it's a, you're not the typical uh, typical figure that you would see touting uh, TBRI in a juvenile right. justice setting, right? right? Like you definitely fit the stereotype of ex-football player. You're a big right. guy, like commanding presence, like you can see why you would get hired to work in that setting is because right. they would say like, oh, this guy, he's going to have total control over the kids, right? So right. will you tell us about your story growing up and kind of what, you know, where are you from and what's made you who you are? Right, Roger. So I grew up in Southern California, right, outside of uh, my dad owned a business in South Central L.A., um, we were in West Covina, which is L.A. County first, okay. right? But when gangs and drugs and hit L.A. real heavy, right, the crack epidemic, yeah. uh, he moved us further east into Riverside, right? So I grew up in Riverside County in the Inland Empire. But, you know, part of that migration in the, in the mid-'80s, right, of people moving from L.A., it just, the whole environment, right, changed, right? Yeah. So really all of Southern California is just, you know, infested with gangs and, and everything else, right? So I was lucky and fortunate enough to have um, football as kind of my first love and passion. And it kept me enough on the beaded path, right, mm -hmm. to, to not stray too far away. Now, I'm not going to say I was perfect, J.D., for by all <laughs> means, because uh, as my dad was running his business, one thing he told me is, you know, it's my job to protect my sister and my mom, right? So we are grown, you're right? We're raised, you, you can call it, you know, back to like Pavlov condition responses, right? If you come at me, right, I'm going to yeah. hit you with a level of aggression that you're not ready for, right? right? right. And I actually have a letter in my backpack from one of my, my best friends we were talking about that I went to college and played ball with. His older brother actually killed somebody, right? But wow. it's just that same mentality. Some people tried to, like, you know, rob him. He pulled out a gun, boom. So I could have easily been in that same situation, yeah. you know. Yeah. So just, you know, just – but at the same time, it's just a different lifestyle in Southern California. So I really had a passion, right? So out, outside of playing football, when I would come home in the summer times, I would work in, like, group home settings, right, with a lot of kids from Kern County, L.A. County, Riverside, San Bernardino counties, and all the most of them, right, 90% of them were involved in the gang to some degree, right? So when I was able to bring a youth from Eastside Rivas, right, and a kid from 1200 block together who are typically mortal enemies, right, based on the hood dynamics, right, right I knew I had a, a gift, right? Because and what was your motivation them. for that? What 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 would lead you to do that as just a college kid who's you know my my friend's mom owned well she was the administrator of a group home right uh -huh. and I was I was thinking this could be cool to you know kind of work with kids and you know I didn't necessarily think I would make a career of it you know I thought I was going to the NFL like everybody else mm -hmm. <laughs> right but yep. um, you know I really after that moment I was kind of like you know, a gut punch from God and saying, you got a call and then a gift to be able to do this. Right. Yeah. And so I'm going to touch on TBRI a little bit since I brought God into it. Right. <laughs> because I really feel like, so like you say, I'm not your typical person. I didn't grow up like talking about feelings and stuff like right. that. Right. And a lot of people think that's what TBRI is all about. Sure. Right. And I tell staff all the time, the greatest gift we can give our kids under our care is the ability to regulate themselves, period, at its core, right? And through, the only way we could do that is by building a connection and, you know, then there's all kinds of strategies that go along with that, right? But at its core, it's hard, even for a kid, even for some of our worst kids, it's hard for a kid to want to do harm to you, right, if they genuinely feel like you care about them. And that's yeah. what I found as early as 2001, okay. working with those, that East Side Riva, right, and that 1200 Black Crip kid, right, who yeah. were mortal enemies, and they found commonalities and were in tears, talking about, man, ain't nobody ever told us stuff like this, right? Wow. But just pouring that love into them because I genuinely want to see you not become a statistic, right, and stay alive. 
so, and out of and out of the uh, you know judicial system. Yeah. So. So that's your starting point for it. And then, how did you get connected in in Texas? Right. And tell me about that. So in 2007, I'd have never came to Texas. I'm a Cali boy, true and through, right? <laughs> I was out there riding motorcycles 190 <laughs> miles an hour and li- living in the fast lane, right, after uh, after football. But my mom had got remarried and moved out here to Austin, Texas. Okay. And so shortly after that, that was in 04 and 06, she got diagnosed with epilepsy, right, and, and needed wow. to have brain surgery. And she actually almost died. She suffers from uh, sudden death seizures, grandma wow. partial seizures. So I... Uh, me and my my wife, had, you know, I told her basically we're moving to Texas, right? So I came out here. The plan was I'm going to come out here, get the job, get our apartment squared away because we're not going to move in with my mom. But that's not happening, right? <laughs> but so came out here, got the apartment squared away. Three months later, moved my family out here. And that's when I got my job at Williamson County. This was 2007, okay. right? And so again, we were the academy, right? So I was an I was classified as an academy officer, working deep nights, right? But I still always had that, you know, that compassion and kind of relational component, reason, yeah. right? That relational component, right? And the fact that I'm from California, right? L.A. All the kids were always kind of drawn to that, yeah. especially the kids that are from out here in Austin, and you know, for the life of me, I would see kids that are claiming Hoover Crip or you know, 60 Crip and our GDs, right? And all right. of these are imported gangs. Like you got Chicago-based gangs, LA-based gangs. So for the, for a while, it took me a, a while to understand like the dynamic of, you know, Central Texas and the gang culture, right? But for whatever reason, they were drawn to me and my stories and, you know, all yeah. that good stuff. So I was always able to build that really good connection relatively fast and easy. Plus, you know, at, at the time I was 290 pounds, so I could, <laughs> I could almost dunk on them, right? But, you know, we, <laughs> right? So, yeah. but then, so fast forward, right? We were the Academy uh, 2015, right? So this is kind of my introduction to TBRI, right? Um, I was basically voluntold, right? Because of my ability to connect with kids, our administration told me that I was going to this week-long training in Austin called TBRI, right, and um, to become a practitioner. So I was like, you know, okay, cool. So a week vacation away from work. Right, right, right. right. But, so I hit that practitioner training, and J.D., I tell you, it changed my life, yeah. right? Darren Jones got up there and talked. Dr. Cross got up there and talked, right? Molly, uh, now Davison, got up there and talked. And they were. T- I felt like they were talking to me, you know what I mean? As far yeah. as that human relational piece, right? And really pouring your heart into what we do and serving the kids, right? And then I, I was like, you know, I am TBRI. That's how I felt, <laughs> right? <laughs> but now you guys have just given me a language to go with, you know, my way of, you know, caring for kids, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're setting boundaries and, you know, the life values terms that they use were a little bit different because I'm, I, you know, I have a little bit more hood element to me, right? Coming yeah. from where I come from. So my language is a little different when I'm relating to the kids. But so anyway, we, we were then charged with training all of our staff at Williamson County, right? As we were combining three programs into one, right? Um, and now we called it CORE. I think it's the acronym is Connect, Overcome, Restore, and Empower. Okay. Ooh, look, I, I ain't been there in a year, and I still remember <laughs> it, right? Nice. <laughs> right? But we, we, we implemented TBRI, and we successfully changed the dynamic of that uh, of the environment. And what we saw in that first year, uh, I think our, our facility administrator ran some numbers, and we had like an 83 or 86% reduction in suicide ideation and wow. attempts, right? Our use of force, meaning our restraints and all of that, went down drastically, right? Um, you know, and that was because of the relationship piece. Yeah. We were no longer telling kids, look, if you don't get up out of that chair and move to the one right next to it, I'm going to pick your little butt up and move you, right, right? right? Now we were providing them with choices, right, and trying to really empower the kids. And, you know, also at the core, right, I'll tell you about, you know, being able to regulate, right, help the kids self-regulate. And really what we're also trying to accomplish is having the kids have that autonomy and be able to really – learn how to negotiate their needs to get their needs met. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Without having to, to act out or, you know, whatever 
behavior that we see, you know what I mean? Whether it's throwing a temper tantrum, throwing a chair, trying to attack a staff with a sock full of dominoes, whatever that yeah. function of that behavior is, right? Learning how to properly use a voice to get their needs met. So how, what is, it, what is an average length of stay that, it, that a kid might be sentenced to when they get, when they get sent out uh, into the system? Right, so that, that could depend. So for Williamson County core, typical length of stay will be about six months. So they come into to the detention center, right, awaiting court. And once they go to court, if the judge hits the gavel and says you're going to, to core, which is just on the other side of the building, right, it could be six months to, you know, I've actually seen a kid in there a year and a half. No okay. fault of itself, but he was abandoned by his mother, right, yeah. who moved off to New York and nobody can get in touch with her. So wow. until we were able to, and he was a good kid, man. He just made a mistake, you know what I mean? And then... Yeah but just no support. And his mother was his only family member that we had a record of, right? And she went to New York and didn't want nothing to do with him. So he oh, ended up having to stay with us. Now, he successfully completed the program because he was so witty and smart, right? Yeah. And he was just a really good kid. Yes, sir, no, ma'am, right? I mean, anything you ask him to do, he was willing to do it, right? Good in school. Like I said, he just made a mistake. So... He was really probably done with our program in four to five months, right? But he had to stay an additional year until yeah. uh, ultimately his mentor was able to adopt him. Wow. And then he was able to go to regular. This was the first time I seen a kid that was in our residential facility actually have daily furloughs to go to high school that was down the street, right? That's crazy. Because of, so that just speaks to his character a little bit, right? But And then it also kind of illustrates some of the circumstances these kids are faced with. Yeah. Right. Imagine that overwhelming feeling of abandonment. Right. And for, you know, for me, that would turn into resentment. And for me at that age, that would turn into anger and right. rage. Right. Right. And so the, the behavior, right, that that spawns from that, it for me, was aggression. Right. But for him, it was a little bit different. He was shut down and get really depressed and, and yeah. things like that. So, you know, when you're looking at some of the the causes, right? What are the root issues behind this kid's behavior, right? And how can we help this young man or young woman, right, really deal with that? You know what I mean? That's that's yeah. kind of the meat and potatoes. Yeah. So I'm wondering about this first this first stint of kids that had academy time and core time because there had to have been kids that overlapped, right? Right. Yes, sir. And, it's and interesting if, you say that. <laughs> tell me about those. Tell me about that first group and and what I mean. How many how many socks full of dominoes did y'all encounter in that first week? Right. <laughs> like, right. So we had some kids right that went from wearing BDU uniforms, right, the military mm -hmm. uniforms, to all of a sudden they were in you know khaki. Uh, detention style pants and a polo shirt, right? right? And we were no longer trying to be punitive. So here's the interesting thing about implementing TBRI. And, I, and I'm fortunate enough to serve as a mentor with TCU. And this is kind of one of the underlying themes, right? And preconceived notions is once you implement TBRI, right? All the staff feel like, oh, there's no more accountability. And they throw their hands up. So I'll be honest, it was a whirlwind, right? And wow. I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, putting out fires constantly all over the place, right? Because staff become more permissive. Now you have staff that were very good at being drills, right? right. That were very, very, very good at doing that, right? So <laughs> now what they're hearing is their message was, oh, we're just supposed to let kids do whatever the hell they want, right? And yeah. that's not the case. TBRI doesn't right. teach us that. So those kids that overlapped, right, some of them, I can remember one, you know, vividly, right? He was like, oh, man, you know, FD, sir, I, you know, I get mad, I want to go do push-ups, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he had been with us for five months, and then we switch over to not using, you know, those punitive means of, of behavior modification, right. but offering them choices and compromises to, to where, you know, he can comply. And he's like, no, F that, F your choices, right? Yeah. So, but... Not to me, but to staff that he had really right. good relationships with, you know, we could talk it out or whatever, yeah. right? But this is also a very volatile, very violent young man that put his forehead through a double pane glass window, mm -hmm. right? Because he became dysregulated. So at the end, right, towards the end, I would say his last two months, right? That's just one of probably 10 incidents of him punching walls or kicking a hole in a wall or something crazy like that, right? 
at the end, he was able to tell staff, now not in the best way, right? But sir, you're yeah. you're, you're triggering me, sir. I let me let, let me calm down. Yeah. Right? Which so is huge. That is huge. See, right. Right. And and part of what for a kid to be able to tell you that you're triggering him, right? Yeah. Even though some people might feel offended by that, at the end of the day, you have a kid that is learning how to recognize how he feels and then trying to ask for that space or appropriate means to calm himself down so he doesn't put his forehead through a double That's pane right. glass, right? Or his fist through your face or whatever it might right. be, which you just said, J.D., it's huge, right? Well, and because at, you know, at the end of the day, you're, the goal is not, for him to be able to just say that you're triggering him, but you're, right. but that, but that shows a step in progress right. to be able to self-regulate. Because right. be, in order to do that, you have to be able to recognize that dysregulation right. coming, right? So that, for I, sure. Uh, I wonder about you know kids who, uh, who are now coming in and 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 you're seeing them come straight into a system that is you know empathetic, empathetic, relationally based. And now going through, what are some of the things that you guys are seeing come out of, coming the, the fruit of this work now coming out? And is that being noticed by other systems around the country? Oh, yes, sir. So <laughs> juvenile justice is taking off, right? So like I said, I'm fortunate enough to get to travel with TCU, whether it's to New Orleans or uh, Oklahoma City was the last practitioner training we just did. So I serve as a mentor. And what we're seeing is that juvenile services, right, is really taking off and wanting to adopt and implement TBRI as their model, right? Because everybody has seen Williamson County and what they did. So now we're doing it at the state level, right? And so all the other counties, not all of them, but a lot of counties across the state are now looking at TJJD, right? Like Harris County, I've done some work down there. We're training a few facilities down there, right? So a lot of people want to adopt this model and, and you know, want to implement TBRI because of what they see. It's really, you know, the right thing to do, right? If we're really trying to uh, serve our community, right, and really trying to serve our kids, there's no better way to be able to do that than to help kids heal so that they're not, you know, still partaking in these criminal activities when they get out of here, right? Because at the end of the day, J.D., what I, this is where the resilient piece comes in, right? Through yeah. our connection with kids, right, and, and us teaching them how to self-regulate, first understand how they feel and then how to regulate, right? That is the resilience that they're going to need to cope with Third Ward Houston when they get back down there, right? right? Or whatever respective environment that they're going back to, a mother that might be absent because she's working two jobs and now the hood is coming and want to want you to start slanging weed or whatever or drugs right. for them, right? It's giving kids the ability to just take a minute, pause, and think, right? Just yeah. for a second. And yeah. that could be the world of a difference. That could literally be the difference between life and death. You know what I mean? Well, I feel like so often for kids who are coming out of uh, poverty, poverty kind of centric communities. Um, there can be a panic when you when you are reintroduced to that community with new tools. Right. There can be a panic of, okay, maybe these tools aren't working. Maybe this isn't. Maybe this doesn't work in this environment, right? And so maybe I do need to go to the corner to to start working or whatever. Right. Um, let Let's stick on the resilience piece for a second. And I I don't know if you've read this article, but there's an article by um, Dr. Chris White. Um, where he talks about attachment and the development of resilience, and uh, basically says, "Hey, for so long we have been we've been teaching that uh, high structure and um, that environment is what builds resilience. High structure and discipline builds resilience. Right. Um, and what we're finding now, and, and this article is incredible. We'll link it in the show notes. But um, it's an article from Chris White. Uh, what we're finding now is that." Uh, attachment and a secure attachment is actually right. the best breeding ground for resilience. And have you, right. have you guys found that to be true in your work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's a huge part of our teaching as well as our attachment styles, right? And so to, in order to become a practitioner, we had to go through the AAI, the adult attachment interview, right? Which was awkward two hour conversation with sure. somebody who ultimately told me about myself, which I'm too <laughs> arrogant. And I basically told her who I am, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm secure attached, but I'm dismissive at the same time. So you know, we had fun with our conversation, but it was very interesting. And that's and that's one of the key elements to the trainings of TBRI and the Texas model is that you, you really and when I say earlier, I mentioned that it changed my life and that attachment, learning about my attachment. Right. 
that allowed me to be mindful of what I bring to every inter interaction, right? Oh, yeah. So because how I grew up, like I grew up in a household where my mom said, because I said so, right? right. It was no right. negotiating. It was no, that's why my lips are so big, because I got popped so many <laughs> times, right? <laughs> <laughs> so oh. she wasn't playing that right but she was a virtually a single mother right who was trying yeah. to really put the hammer down and keep me you know on a straight and narrow as much as she could right so you know I find myself like after taking that training right really because with my older son I had to apologize to him because I adopted sure. a lot of what my mom was right but once I went through that training I was like oh my god I got it wrong you know what wow. I mean so now like it's made me a better husband a better father a better servant to the youth right a better trainer right and a lot of that is understanding my attachment and then understanding too right I think we're 80 percent likely to be you know our, the attachment of our of our primary caregiver right that same right. attachment style but the gold standard, like you say, is, is basically secure attachment, right? <clears throat> what you what we do know is that through connection, right, we can have earned secure attachment, right? Yeah. So just because a kid might have grew up in a disorganized, you know, caregiver style, right, or a dismissive caregiver style, ultimately through connection with somebody, right, and building that resilience and 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 you know deploying all the strategies we use to intentionally connect and and poor all the pro social skills a kid can have what we call earned security right yeah. to where yeah yeah so, so okay I, i'm thinking about there's a lot of our a lot of our listeners work in uh maybe some uh, non-profit kind of youth youth centered organizations where it might be kids who are um in the juvenile justice system it might be kids who are um you know in sports recreation ministries and stuff like that um, or, or in different programs where uh, they're, they're in an early intervention type. If you were speaking to those who are working in those environments and you're saying, um, you know, I, I want to give you, I want to give you the, the self work that has helped me the most. Um, are, are there a few things that you realized through that attachment interview and, and starting to realize these things helped me to feel like I had what it took to be able to give myself away. Um, are, are there any things that you would say, here's the first few steps you want to take uh, to be able to, to be able to offer what you need to, to these kids. Right. So I think attachment would be huge, right? Understanding your own attachment style. And again, that allows you to be mindful of your own triggers, right? What sets you off, right? And then understanding ways that you you can use, right, for self-care, right? And that ultimately, if you're bringing your baggage into the workplace, no matter who you serve, right, it's going to be a toxic environment for right. you, for whoever you engage with, right? So understanding your triggers, what you need to do to kind of self-regulate yourself, right? So for me, it's getting in my truck, right? putting on some Sade or some Maxwell, some slow jams, <laughs> right? And driving for two or three yeah. hours. Some people go to a bar, some people do other things. I get in my truck and I drive, but it allows me to kind of put everything in perspective, realign my scattered oh, thoughts so in good. my brain, right? And really just, you know, take that time for myself, right? So <clears throat> that would be the first thing is make sure, you know, you're, you're doing what you need to do as far as self-care is concerned. And then really just understand that, uh, you could be, right, because we wear the hat of so many different roles sometimes that we're not even aware of, right? So you ultimately can be that that individual in this kid's life, right, that helped change his trajectory, right? Yeah. And I've seen that so many times, and I've been told by so many different kids, so I really look at you like a father. When I left Williamson County, the, they had like a little, you know, celebration deal in the gym, and it was awkward, and they put me, you know, in the center <laughs> stage kind of deal, right? But some of them kids got up there and were in tears because I was leaving the TJJD, right? And one of them, just exactly what he said, he said, sir, I know when, when I first met you, I cussed you out, right yeah but you never left my side right and then he starts getting choked up and i'm getting a little emotional thinking about it but Man. he says you never left my side and i've never had anybody you know what i mean like that and so for that i look at you like a father figure and then he tries to keep talking but he started crying all, all i could do was give him a hug jd right and then he sat yeah. down right but he was so distraught that i was leaving you know what i mean because i've seen him at his worst Right. And he was dealing with a lot of heavy baggage when he first came to us. His grandmother was, you know, dying of stage four cancer. They're in a one bedroom apartment, low income housing. Right. And uh, he was part of our JJAP program. His sister would disappear, you know, 
on you know weeks on end his mother would disappear weeks on end on meth benches and stuff like that and they would come in and steal his stuff right he was part of the gangster disciples locally right so i mean he had, he just had so much going on on top of his own you know mental issues that he had going on so again you you look at that right so how do we better best serve this young man right it ain't yeah. being punitive and making him do push-ups for not making his bed right 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 it's, it's teaching him how to cope with what he's got going that's on right. that's right, right. yeah and yeah. shortly after he got arrested and detained, right, and sent to court, his grandmother ended up passing, right? And so, like I told him, right, he he really wouldn't open up to anybody, but we had a real good conversation in our visitation room where he kind of fell out crying and, and all of that good stuff, right? But he really disclosed how he felt, right? And that was a powerful kind of moment for us in building our relationship because I was there with him, right? I went through it, I, you know, you, you see this chain, right? Yeah. So I talked about me losing my grandfather and walking in on, on that process, right? And we really just were in the moment and, and connected, right? But he then allowed me into his space, right? Into yeah. him being able to correct him. So instead of cussing out staff, right, I can tell him, you know, Mark, come here for a minute, right? Let me holler at you before you make a, a wrong decision. Come here, come walk with me, right? And then, so I would start using these different strategies to help him understand when you get frustrated, it's cool, right? right. The true testament of a man is how you deal with frustration, right? Not whether or not we get frustrated. So let me show you how to, you know, deal with it appropriately. We would do push-ups, we would do wall pushes, we would do seat pushing pulls, we would do deep breathing, we would just walk and and and, and use a lot of profanity sometimes, right? <laughs> So whatever it took, right? But what he's learning in that process is different ways that he can calm himself, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, JD, I go off on tangents sometimes because it's just so many different avenues, man. This stuff is just so relevant. But what I know is by doing deep breathing, right, it's manipulating your brain chemistry, right? If I can yep. get you to take five or six deep, deep breaths, it's, it's releasing the cortisol and, and, and all of those good chemicals in your brain to calm your body, right? And so for the aggressive kids like me, I've got scars all over my knuckles from punching walls and punching people growing up. Had I known that I could do push-ups and it, you know, chemically does the same exact thing, right? It's totally. as, as getting into a fight or a restraint, right? Yeah. Then, um, you know, maybe I wouldn't have arthritis now <laughs> at, at 39. <laughs> right? So, so. I, no, I, I think the tangents are good because I think what's really helpful is um, there's two things. So one, for the practitioners, for those who are kind of in that environment, I, I would imagine that this is a this is a different world for them. Like you're you're hearing this stuff and thinking, Man, there might be a way that I don't have to leave the leave the the facility horse every day from screaming all day. Right. Like there might be a way that I can leave without having to, you know, put my hands on a kid every day. Like there might be a right. way I can leave without, you know, having the heartbreak of watching somebody get, you know, put in the deepest right. level of containment, whatever. Um, and I think for the second, the second thing that's really helpful is for a lot of us uh, when we're growing up in one specific environment, um, you tend to view kids in the juvenile justice system as I'm using air quotes here for those who can't see it. Bad ass kids. Bad kids, right? right? Yeah, bad kids. And well, these kids, they've got to learn some discipline. That this is the problem. Right. Is they don't have anybody at home teaching them. So I think it's really helpful for you to be able to break down. Uh, every one of us has a story. Right. Everybody's got a story. And for the kids who come from the most um, the most opportunity uh, sparse environments, you develop those survival tactics. Because you need to survive. It's not a right. it's not a matter of speech. Like that's a literal survival tactic that you've got and it and it helps you to survive. And so to learn to put the guard down on those and actually, you know, tap into your emotions and process what's been going on is a ter has got to be a terrifying thing for a kid that comes right. to an environment like that. For sure. Absolutely. And I think as far as helping, so that's one of the first and biggest hurdles when implementing, you know, a trauma-informed model, right, is helping staff switch that lens from looking at kids as being willfully disobedient. They just yeah. need structure, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and somebody need to show them some act right, right, to yeah. understanding the iceberg, right? And by the iceberg, I mean, you know, the trauma lens, right? Looking through a different lens. So not being willfully disobedient, but understanding that their behaviors is a manifestation of the trauma that they've been through in their past, right? So they're 
you know, their their survival brain is activated constantly, right? Which right. I'm referring to the amygdala, right? So yep. kids that live in a in a hyper state of arousal constantly, right? And we know through science that you know that's toxic to the body, right? It releases those stress chemicals in your in your bloodstream constantly, and it's ultimately you know, my colleague, right, that I work with, he tells a really powerful story about becoming a type one diabetic at the height of his kind of uh, trauma that he was, you know, he was beat the crap out of constantly, right? He scores Man. like an eight out of 10 on the aces, right? And wow, so wow, wow. when we're training our staff, right, to hear that testimony, it gives me the chills every time, right? Because there's no other medical scientific uh, explanation on why he became a diabetic, right? Other than that toxic stress that he was constantly under day in and day out. And at the height of all that abuse, he was then diagnosed with, with, with type one diabetes. And now he's, you know, it really altered his life and he's got to wear a pump and, and the whole nine. Right. So again, yeah. that, that hurdle sometimes can feel like a mountain because people are just so stuck in a traditional, you know, these are bad kids and they need to be punished. The judge has already punished them. She's already hit the gavel. So to touch back on your question you asked a while ago, I kind of hit on a county level, but for the state level, right, TJJD, we might have kids here from a year, right, that are look to kids that are looking at 35 years determining sentences, right? So kids that have committed, you know, murder, right? We had a 12-year-old that shot his, his brother in the chest, right? And so he's looking at, you know, 35 years on a determinant sentence, wow. you know, and I don't know the whole intricacies of his particular case but sure. i just thought it was so crazy that a 12 year old could pick up a gun and shoot his sibling so Man. yeah we're dealing <laughs> with some uh some really hard some really hard cases but a lot of times even with you know some kids that have committed some of the most heinous acts right i get on the dorms and i talk to them they ain't no different from you 100%. They ain't no different from me yes right? that's right that's right they acted on an emotion mm -hmm. jd and that's what it comes down to how can we get kids not to act on that emotion, not to be so impulsive, right? And yeah. there's very intentional ways we go about doing that. But at the foundation, it's all about connection because a kid ain't going, you know, he's not going to listen to you if he if he's not connected with you. That's right. right. That's right. Um, and I, number one, I can talk about this all day. Uh, number two, <laughs> you and I both have other stuff we got to get get going on right. uh, today. So uh, why don't we kind of close with this? Um, we, we talked about sort of the, the self-work that would be needed on the front end of just introducing yourself to this if you were in this field. So for those who are in this field or even for those who are uh, who, who might feel like you're describing their kids at home um, it, with these behaviors and stuff, why don't you talk through maybe some of the most uh, – introductory elementary tools that we've got for helping when, when, when a kid is off the rails, lids flipped, amygdala is up, they're in their survival response, fight, flight, or right. freeze. Like um, when they're there, what are some of the, what are some of those introductory tools that you're teaching your team to use to help bring right. regulation? Right. So <clears throat> at the, at the root of it, I always, when the kid's lid is flipped, right, we know that they can only hear three to five words, right? So this isn't the time to hit them with a long lecture, right? The the grandparent speech, because they're not going to mm -hmm. hear or retain any of it anyway, right? So I always, like for me, I call it, you know, uh, my Jedi mind trick, right? I'm trying to distract the kid from his distraction, his or her distraction, whatever they're fixated on, right? So if, if I'm in this classroom setting and I'm mad at this kid or the teacher, I want to remove them from that that's that situation, right? Not by force, but hopefully I've got enough money in the bank that when I show up on a scene, right, and I could say, young lady or young man, let, let me get two minutes, right? And we can go on a walk. And I give them that platform to vent, get it out, right? And then we can, um, you know, go on to different strategies. So for, for some young men, it might be push-ups, right? Yeah. To help calm them down so they don't punch anything or entice a restraint. I had uh, another young man that was kind of on the spectrum of autism. I, w I had uh, little bubbles, right? And I don't know why one day I he was in the middle of restraint. I blew some bubbles and literally wow. the kid looked up and seen the <laughs> bubbles flying told staff, let me effing go, right? And started popping bubbles. And so then I'm like, here, you want to try, right? And so that was just kind of an outside of the box way yeah. to 
distract him from his distraction, right? And so when I give him the stick of the bubbles and now he blows a couple and then I say, hey, why don't you try taking a deeper breath and then blow, right? So in my <laughs> mind, I know I'm manipulating this kid's brain chemistry, right, to calm yep. his body. But yeah. for him, he's just blowing bubbles, right? And so that became uh, like an everyday tool that we use. And like I had a stockpile of the little <laughs> 99 cent store bubbles. Keeping them in business. Right? Because, <laughs> man, I knew when he went off, right? And even our FA, one time we ran to a, a, a code 99, right? And I said, oh, you know, shoot, I, I, I left my bubbles, right? Said, <laughs> I said, sir, go get them in there in my, you know, in my office desk drawer. And he comes and, he, and then we're, we're actively restraining this young man because he was trying to throw like uh, the teacher's desk, uh, not the desk, but the computer off the desk, right? Okay. And so, yeah. you know, he's acting out. He's in one of his phases that is almost uncontrollable to him, right? He's on the spectrum. This kid yeah. is very low functioning, right? So, you know, we're in the middle of restraint, and then my, my FA says, what do you want me to do? I said, blow the bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> Release the bubbles. And, and almost instantly, boom, it, 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 it disarmed that, that fear response that he yeah. was, you know, activated, right? He was no longer in that survival brand, and you can see that prefrontal cortex, you know, come back. So, I, again, it's all going to be predicated on your relationship with the kid, right, and what you've introduced to him and what works to him or her, right? I had another kid, that, that autistic schizophrenic kid, right? We would work out, right? He found some, some. Huh. Uh, he saw, so I, I coached my son's football team, right? And he yeah. saw tackling dummies in the back seat, right? So when he got dysregulated, and this only happened by chance because I was able to get him out of that environment, right, where yeah. he was dysregulated, uh, getting attacked by other kids and attacking other kids, came outside and let him vent for a while. He looked in the back of my truck, asked what that is, boom, and I got him, right? Wow, that's awesome. That was that was the, uh, the tool that I was able to use. So I told him after a long conversation about, you know, me being a D coordinator and the three Ds of defense and him needing to be, you know, discipline, right? If he wanted to be on my team, right? So we made a pact that whenever he got frustrated or angry, right, we would do a sensory break, right? Uh -huh. We would remove him from the classroom or whatever part of programming, go outside, and I would allow him to do, like, different workouts, right? He thought he was training for the NFL combine, but I know... <laughs> what's going on neurochemically in his brain is that through this proprioceptive input, right, it's calming his body and it's getting him to a point to where he'll be able to function the rest of the day, right? So again, that's the resilient piece, right? That's the tools that we're teaching these kids that they can utilize in order to help them calm down. But it's all predicated on that relationship, right? Yeah. Any any last thoughts on building resiliency and the... And the um kind of some of the tools that you guys might be using aside from those first steps, but um, what, what are you guys seeing in terms of effectiveness with building resiliency over time in your facilities? So JD, you just opened up the can of worms for another <laughs> hour's worth of conversation <laughs> as far as some of the tools that we're using. Okay. So one of our proactive tools is nurture groups, right? And then through nurture groups, we'll purposely dysregulate the youth through an activity, right? Get their engine on red, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then we'll do an engine check-in and then we'll intentionally teach them a strategy to calm down, whether that's seat pushing pulls, wall pushes, right? Something proprioceptive or some deep breathing, right? And so you repeat that over and over and over again, right? So that's building that self-awareness, right? That, that kind of uh, emotional wherewithal to recognize where I am on this. Uh, we have red, green, and blue, right? Kind of our engine plate, right? So sure. understanding where I am on this engine plate and then being able to regulate myself for whatever activity we're getting ready to do, right? So if yeah. I don't want to be in the red, right? If I'm sitting in class, I need to learn how to calm myself down. Nor do I want to be in the blue, right, if I'm getting ready for a football game. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's my job to get my team in the red and get ready to go obliterate this other squad over here, yeah. right? So that's that's one of the proactive tools we use. And then in TJJD, we've implemented a, a MAPS room. It's called Making a Plan for Success. So if a kid is dysregulated in the classroom, they can go into the MAPS room. And in there, there's proprioceptive stations, there's you know journaling, there's deep breathing stations, so on and so forth. On the dorms, we have what you call common areas, right? So if a kid gets dysregulated, he can request to go to the common area. And there we have fidgets and uh, weighted blankets, weighted animals, right? Uh, rocking chairs, just different tools. We also have, as, a, as kind of a 
a separate hallway for our security unit, a regulation zone, right? So we're doing everything that we can, right, to help kids not have to go and get locked up to security, right? If they yeah. need to get off the dorm, yeah. RSU unit could come to the dorm and take them to the regulation zone, right? Yeah. So it's just that it's an area for you to be able to regulate, right? And so hopefully our staff, or our development coaches that are assigned to that particular unit, right, have the knowledge and the wherewithal to help whichever kids come in there, right? So effectiveness, I think it's very effective and I wish we would have had these tools at Williamson County, to be honest, right? We were just kind of swinging in the dark a lot of times, right? And trying yeah. to figure things out as we grew, you know what I mean, with our program. But we were very effective in changing the culture, right? And like I said, I've embraced moms that are crying because they've seen tremendous growth in their kids when they come home on furlough. Now all of a sudden they want to help around chores and, you know, are able to accept no right just as small as that sounds Huge. right yes. able to accept yeah. no without throwing a big temper tantrum right yeah i've embraced kids that you know didn't have any um any support at home right but you continue to work with them i got you know one of those instant messages i was talking about was from a young man that had no support so he turned to the streets big old kid too a good six two you know 245 like but he's yeah. a blood out here and, and really involved in the streets but at the end of the day he's got new motivation right he showed me right. a picture of his son right wow. and he thanked me for showing him the ways of being a, a real man right and not a you know a street dude right so Powerful. i would end by telling everybody you know what i mean one you can't take anybody on a journey that you haven't been on or willing to go on yourself right Ooh, say that again <laughs> right well that Man. that's not mine that comes from dr cross right <laughs> so i plagiarize dr cross right now sure. but you cannot take anybody on a journey right that you have not been on or willing to go on yourself right yeah. and then the second thing is you know like I said earlier, we wear the hats of so many different roles, right? And it could be you that makes a difference in the kid's life, right? So if not you, then who's it going to be, yeah. all right? Yeah. That's powerful stuff. Troy, that is, that is <laughs> powerful stuff, man. I cannot thank you enough for your time. And uh, I yes, hope sir. you know that you. coming on today ropes you into being a recurring guest on the show uh, oh, over time. Absolutely, so. anytime. <laughs> There's so many gaps and holes that I feel like, you know, I left out here and there. But like you said, I could talk to you for five, six hours about this sure. easy, right? And just how the impact that it's had on my personal life, my family's life, the kids in the jail, you know what I mean? I've got 12 years worth of stories of being inside of secure facilities, right, that I can share with you, you know? Well, so I know there's going to be uh, probably a flood of those who reach out to you in the aftermath of this saying, <laughs> hey, uh, I need to do some time with you on the phone coming up soon. <laughs> right. Um, well, man, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you again for your time, and, and we'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Take care. Man, big thanks to Troy McPeak uh, for coming on the show today. And uh, I just keep thinking about what he said. The greatest gift we can give the kids we care for is the ability to self-regulate. And just let that sink in for a second. I, I, I know that for me, uh, our conversation today was... Uh, very encouraging and, and inspiring and uh, it gives me some juice, I think, to be able to go uh, tackle the second half of a day of parenting during a pandemic with four kids, all doing virtual school while my wife and I try to work from home. So yeah, you can pray for us. We are, <laughs> as I'm sure you are too, we are, uh, we're just in it, man. Isn't this thing uh, hard right now? Isn't this, isn't this a strange time in life? Uh, speaking of that, we are hoping to talk to some of our parent trainers uh, coming up in the future in, in a roundtable discussion uh, about parenting during the pandemic and um, parenting during a rice crisis and, uh, and, and what, what are we seeing that's working? What are some, some practices and some tools that, uh, that maybe you hadn't thought of or, or innovations that, um, that have helped around the house uh, during this time? And so, um, you know, those helps can't be hiring you babysitters. We can't do that for you, obviously. Um, but what we would love to do is, is to hear other ideas that you've got. Uh, what would be helpful for you? What would you want to know in future episodes? Um, are there guests that you'd want us to have on or topics that you specifically would, would like to see us cover? Let us know. Uh, you can go to empoweredtoconnect.org and click on the podcast page. And then on that page, there's a feedback form. We'd love to know your thoughts on uh, today's episode, any of the episodes recently, or uh, what you'd like to hear from us 
us in the future. Uh, as always, if you're enjoying the show, we hope that you will go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review us uh, and review it five stars. It does help uh, our show to get uh, listed on some parenting charts that will help uh, those who are looking for this type of content uh, to be able to find it. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to share it with a friend, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, and so we hope that you will do that. Listen, for Kyle Wright, our uh, engineer, and for Tad Jewett, our um, artist, musician, and for Troy McPeak, uh, Mo Ottinger, and Tana Ottinger, I'm J.D. Wilson, and this has been another episode of the Empowered to Connect podcast. We will see you next week. Next week.